Hola, buenas tardes, bienvenidos y bienvenidas al canal de YouTube del Museo de Bellas Artes de Bilbao y a este encuentro con la artista Maider López que eh, tiene lugar en el auditorio del museo el 3 de agosto de 2020. En el encuentro participa también, aunque desde Londres y por vía telemática, el comisario y crítico de arte Hans Ulrich Obris. Los tres vamos a conversar sobre una pieza de Maider actualmente instalada en el museo, Arnasa, una pieza efímera y site-specific que ha contado con el apoyo eh, económico de la Fundación Banco Santander a través del programa La Obra Invitada. Para quienes nos sigan habitualmente, nos conozcan, eh, este programa, La Obra Invitada, saben que es uno de los más longevos de los que llevamos a cabo en el museo. Nació hace ahora 19 años y la, la pieza de Maider hace la edición número 63. Eh, la conversación, si me gustaría adelantarles, que va a desarrollarse parte en español y parte en inglés. Buenos días, Maider. Quiero darte las gracias por acompañarnos hoy en el auditorio del museo para dar concierto de detenimiento sobre Arnasa y sobre tu trabajo en general. Hola, eh, con muchas ganas de ello. Después de haber trabajado tan intensamente en la instalación Arnasa, eh, me apetece mucho que hablemos de ella. Bien, gracias. Eh, Maider López, nacida en San Sebastián en 1975, se, profe, se formó en la Facultad de Bellas Artes de la Universidad del País Vasco primero y en la Chelsea School of Arts de Londres después. Eh, es una de las artistas vascas con mayor posición internacional y eh, su trabajo se ha desarrollado, sobre todo en los últimos años, a partir de acciones o de intervenciones en las que el público es habituado, es, es animado a participar y en la que se le ofrecen siempre, yo creo, nuevos puntos de vista sobre situaciones cotidianas que tendemos o el público tiende a dar por, por, por hechas. Quiero dar también la, también la bienvenida a Hans Ulrich Obrist, que se incorpora a nuestro encuentro vía telemática desde Londres. Como saben ustedes, Obrist es director artístico de la Serpentine Gallery de Londres y sobre todo uno de los más respetados comisarios y críticos de arte. La entrevista, la conversación han sido desde el comienzo de su carrera no solo una práctica eh, habitual sino fundamental en su trabajo como, como comisario y sus conversaciones con artistas pero también con arquitectos, científicos, escritores que hoy en día son accesibles en, en formato de libro, eh, constituye una suerte de historia del arte contemporáneo desde 1996 hasta nuestros días. Um, Mr. Obrist, welcome back to our museum and thank you so much for being with us today, because we know your schedule is always very complicated. Uh, may I suggest that we start watching a short fragment of Arnasa and then talk about it for a while?
Thank you very much. So uh, very happy to have this conversation um, with um, uh, with Maida today. And of course, we're going to talk about your work in general. Uh, but we're also going to talk about uh, the Artak Zavaldus, the uh, current uh, commission. Uh, and uh, this commission is part actually of a series of the Banco Santander Foundation uh, at the Bilbao Fine Arts uh, Museum. Um, and uh, uh, of course, it uh, is a piece from 2020, uh, which happened within the context, uh, Maida, you did this work in the context of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, when you were actually invited to interact with uh, the museum uh, and reflect also on the role a museum can play uh, uh, for society in uh, the 21st uh, century. Now, it's interesting because uh, there have been 63 editions uh, uh, actually uh, over 19 years. Uh, and this is the first time in all these 19 years um, that uh, actually uh, um, uh, a work has been related so closely to the space of the museum, but also the current events. And of course, the result of this process is the piece Arnasa, which is an installation actually uh, basically varying uh, in terms of brightness uh, uh, at the pace of breathing. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, the museum, of course, being closed, uh, and it reminded me actually of uh, a piece of uh, Philippe Pareno, which uh, Philippe Pareno realized in an exhibition which uh, we did with him uh, in, uh, 90, yeah, in the late 90s, around 1999, in Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris, where he created a work called Le Mans Analogue. It was basically uh, homage to uh, the writer René Domal, and that was a piece which would always be there also when actually no humans would be present in the museum. So the piece would also be there uh, at night. And uh, uh, your, your piece is different from the, the more analog, but it's, it has this parallel to Philippe Pareno's piece that it is also there when no one is there. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about the process, about how you answer to this invitation from the Banco Santander Foundation and the Bilbao Fine Arts Museum, and to tell us a bit about the genesis of this piece, Arteac Zabaldus. Yes. So um, we were in the most extreme uh, confinement due to the COVID-19, and then I had the call from the museum invite me, inviting me to create a site-specific project for the museum. So, as you say, the context in which we start thinking was a museum close that didn't have any visitor for two months. And then uh, I did this site visit in which I visit the Fine Arts Museum in Bilbao. And I have such a strong feeling and a strong uh, sensation of this museum being close not having any visitors for two months and being me walking there. Uh, when I was walking there in this situation, I have the feeling that the museum was very alive, even if we weren't there. Like all these artworks remain there. We weren't in the museum, but the piece of art has such an, a strong presence there. So I was uh, feeling how the museum, even close, um, was having like, um, let's say, was contributing to the society, even close, only by having all these artworks there. And the works could relate to each other or, or be there. So for me, it was like a garden, let's say, that um, even if we can't go to this garden, this garden is contributing to the, to the, to the genera, to the community by the trees with the earth or the bees going there. So here, as you say, it was the, the situation of a closed museum and how intervene it, um, let's see, from the streets because we were conf in confinement, but people was going to be able to go to the streets to walk. 
So in this situation that people can walk in the street but cannot enter the museum, how to think the museum from outside? And from that idea, it came the possibility to graduate the light of the museum uh, so that it turned on and off very slow to the pace of breathing. So that in a way the museum itself is breathing. Now obviously this means also that uh, the museum uh, or that your exhibition was actually uh, seen by, by flaneurs. It was seen by people passing by. In, in your text you, you relate it to Baudelaire's, the idea of the flaneur. I often think of you know, Robert Walzer also, the idea of a promenadology, as Carl Selig says, the idea of, you know, uh, and Lucius Bocca made a whole science out of that, the science of going on a walk. Now, it's interesting because, of course, um, uh, one thing which in a moment of a crisis uh, is also very relevant is that we think about how actually art can matter in society and how it can reach, you know, society. And of course, we should never forget that museums are, of course, public spaces and they have, you know, sensational amounts of visitors. The, the visitor figures in museums have increased a lot uh, over the last years. However, it is still um, a very small percentage of society uh, who would actually visit uh, museums. And, uh, uh, and in a way, of course, there is still this threshold, right? The threshold, uh, and even if museums have free admission, we have, a, you know, free admission at the Serpentine. So we have more than one million visitors a year. But that means still that many people in the park, they, uh, they would see our pavilions, they would see the public artworks, because actually uh, with these works, we go to the visitor and uh, they can see them also by surprise. And I think that's very important with public art, that we can actually, you know, reach people who would not necessarily set out in the morning to go and see an exhibition, but who would somehow be passerbys or would walk through the city or would walk in a park and all of a sudden, you know, they would see something they would never have expected to see. And it's interesting that in a moment of, of crisis, this idea of public art is, is even more important. Uh, I mean, we can see this, for example, uh, in the 1930s, you know, I was uh, friendly with Helen Levitt, the photographer, uh, and she's actually really interesting in relation to your piece because she made street photography and, and, and films also, you know, of, of streets and she, basically told me, she was very old when I visited her and she was in her, I would say, 90s. Uh, it was a, a chilly day in New York City, I would say 1995 probably, uh, and I was in her apartment and uh, uh, there was a lamp, you know, which gave some warmth. Uh, and because it was the warmest spot in the apartment, her cat was actually sitting between her and me, you know, underneath the light. And so we had a conversation and she said, um, she was really, you know, at that time, probably in her 80s or 90s, and I was very young, I was 25 or something like that, mid, mid late 20s. And she said, you know, it is quite likely that during your lifetime, there will be at some point a very big crisis. Like she said, we have experienced it, or her generation has experienced it with the Great Depression in the 1930s. And she said, during the Great Depression, you know, there was the Roosevelt program, the New Deal program, and these different, there were actually different New Deal programs and they supported the artists, but they supported artists through public art. So the idea was to do murals, and the idea was really to bridge the gap between art and society. And it seems to me that within your piece, by actually making the, visible, the museum visible from outside, by creating a piece which is there for everyone for 24 hours, people don't have to buy a ticket, it has to do also with this idea of democratization of art. Can you talk a little bit about this impetus? Yes, yes, I completely agree with all what you say. Uh, by this piece, uh, passersby, people they don't know they will see a, a, an artwork, they see the piece because the light emerges through the windows, uh, expanding the museum, let's say, giving movement to the museum and animating the museum. And, and this uh, gradual change of light can be seen from the street, so that, as you say, uh, passersby uh, will find the piece, even if they didn't know the piece was there. And it's a way of connecting indoor and outdoor, the museum with the city, integrating the city, the museum in the city. 
Uh, and for me, it's very important, as you say, this idea of walking and finding the peace. Uh, it might be someone that don't even pay attention to the peace, but even don't pay in the attention, this light is coming out and coming in. Uh, talking about the inner life of the museum, but about this connection between the museum and the city, so that even if you don't pay many, much attention to the piece, you will notice it. Like, I might not notice you are breathing, but you are breathing. And then this breathing is affecting me in a way. So, um, for me, it's very important in this case how to see the museum from outside, because as well, through the light, uh, pieces of art that they are inside the museum can be seen from the streets. But with, when the graduation of the light goes, turns out again, uh, they disappear. So this appearance and disappearance of the architecture of the museum, but the art piece, are giving this relation with the passersby, with uh, people in the city. And, and as well, it's something that I like about the piece, when I am watching the piece, and it's gradually going, turning on the lights and gradually turning off, uh, when the light is off, I see the reflection of the city in the windows because they are dark, so the city is reflected. So it's all the time this relationship between inside the museum and outside. And as Serpentine, this museum is in a park. So there are many people passing by uh, through this park and connecting to the museum that uh, sometimes is this museum I never enter. But through this piece, they can connect directly to it. And it's of course a very interesting. It's a very interesting moment also for you to do this piece. Uh, also, uh, not only related, you know, to the closure of the museum, and I, I would say you you kept the museum alive because so many museums all over the world have been closed, and there was also something very sad. I found it very sad this idea of passing by museums, you know, which were dead, which were not alive. And so during this moment of closure, you you kept the museum alive. But I think in uh, in a way, it also goes beyond this this, this COVID crisis, and it goes also. Uh, it's also a, a, a look into the future of the Bilbao Museum, because of course Norman Foster uh, has won the competition uh, and has uh, actually uh, uh, done a very fascinating project for Bilbao, uh, where you know he wants more shows that actually to to make a museum, to extend the museum, uh, uh, is actually not only architecture, but it's a form of urbanism. And the way how the Foster Project, you know, creates public space, the way the Foster Project connects the inside and the outside museum, you know, the way it actually links the park and the museum is something which I think also resonates. Uh, and it's almost like your piece anticipates, you know, what is going to come. Yes, as you said, um I, I always work with uh, a specific context in mind. Here we had not only the Bilbao Fine Art Museum, the city, the park, the architecture, uh, the collection, all the context, but we have a very strong context with was COVID-19. So for me at the beginning, at that moment in which almost all the museums in the world were closed, uh, it was in a way difficult to, to reach this context, but at the same time, uh, working with a specific context uh, offers a universal uh, context, a uh, project, let's say. So working with the Bilbao Fine Arts with the COVID, COVID in that specific moment, from that uh, context result Arnasa piece, which is a piece that could work in all the museums, not all, but many of the museums in the world, talking about museums co co uh, close, but as you say, not only, uh, is not limited to that specific context. It comes uh, up much new interpretations as uh, expanding the museum, as uh, giving movement to the museum and and this connection with breathing for me is as well very i don't know like poetic of course in this moment that COVID was a a, a breathing illness but not only that like um 
by this light and transformation of, of, on the light in the museum, um, we are, as you say, pointing the museum in the city. We are integrated in, in the city. But for example, when I watch it, I try to synchronize my breathing to the breathing of the building so that both are breathing at the same time. And, and, and by this, we are connecting to each other. We are, as you say, expanding what is inside and what is outside the museum. And we are spreading the museum, let's say. And I suppose it also reminds me of Roland Barthes, you know, a very interesting, Roland Barthes, very interesting lecture series, How to Live Together. Uh, it's a series of lectures where he actually explored solitude uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, also the, the necessary uh, contact, uh, actually, for individuals uh, to, to live together. That, that's why the seminar was called How to Live Together. And it's very much about the pedagogical method of Roland Barthes. Now, I, I find this one of the most interesting books to read or to reread during the, the lockdown, because, of course, Barthes uh, elaborates this notion of idiorhythmy. And you mentioned the rhythm, you know, the rhythm of the visitor, the rhythm of the museum, the rhythm of your piece. And Roland Barthes' notion of idiorhythmy is actually uh, about a form uh, of living together where, uh, as he says, one recognizes and respects the individual rhythm of uh, the other. So it's really interesting because he looks at five, you know, texts that represent actually uh, five different, you know, spaces of, of life, of living. There is Emile Zola's, you know, Pobui, which is a Parisian apartment story, so as to say. There is Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain, which, as we all know, uh, is, is, a, is a sanatorium, and that's, of course, another book which was really relevant, again, during the lockdown. There's André Gide's La Séquestre de Poitiers, which is a story of a woman who is always locked into her bedroom. Uh, then there is Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, which is, uh, you, you know, the, the famous story of uh, a castaway on a very, uh, on a very faraway island. And then, uh, very importantly, there is Palidius's Lausiac history, which is really about, you know, the is about monks, is about the ascetic monks uh, in the desert, and you know, connects also to to Bart's experience with uh, Mount Atmos, and and of course this idea that on the one hand, you know, there is a search for solitude, but on the other hand, you know, we cannot live uh, without basically, uh, you know, in dialogue with the other. And for this very reason, it's about negotiating, Bart says, how we can live together. Uh, and this idea, you know, of, of, of idiorhythmy is so interesting because it means to live together, but also to respect the rhythms of the other, not to impose a rhythm to the other. Anyway, I was thinking of that when I heard about your piece. Yes. Uh... Like uh, in my practice, normally this idea of how we can live together is very strong. And uh, normally uh, I invite people to create a, a temporary communities, um, to transform the public space by the way they live in the public space, I relate to each other. And of course, suddenly we were in this new situation where I, I was about to intervene in public space in the outdoor of the museum. And I was in, in a place where I couldn't act as I always act, because normally I will uh, invite two people to live together. And suddenly this was a danger, what I always have been trying to do. So as well, it was very, very challenging to deal with this situation. And then by changing the rhythm of the lights in the museum, we were talking about all what you are saying, how everyone we have our own rhythm and yeah. how even there we can live together, as you put it, we can live together in respecting others, one's limits, other one's rhythm. And um, this idea that the museum that is normally still is closed, 
uh, you don't have any contact with the museum, maybe with the building, maybe with the garden, but there is not any connection there. Through a very simple act, an already existing element uh, as the light, is only a, a small shift and a small transformation in this light rhythm that creates not only the feeling that this museum is breathing, that this building is breathing and expanding outside, but as well as you say, talking about rhythm uh, and about how all of us, we have a different rhythms. And on that as well, I had another piece uh, done in the past in a swimming pool that yeah. we, they all need to swim in a line. It wasn't allowed to pass somewhere, someone else. So if someone was going very, very slow, you need to go behind him very, very slow to adapt to other people's rhythm. Now, it's interesting because uh, it's about living together, but also about rituals, I suppose. Your work has often to do with rituals. And, uh, you know, an early piece was Atascoa, which took place in Inside Navarre, where you had actually an open call for participants, you know, to create a traffic jam in the mountains. Now, uh, an event we usually would experience in the city uh, all of a sudden happened in a place where it usually would not happen. And, uh, you know, there was, of course, also an environmental connotation to it about the cars and, and pollution and nature. But it seemed to me also a, a ritual. Can you talk a little bit about the, this, this, this aspect of ritual in, in your work? Because it seems almost also what you did in Bilbao, you know, it was a public ritual. You inserted a 24-hour ritual into the city. Uh, and Tarkovsky always said, the filmmaker, uh, you know, we live in a time where we are somehow bereft of rituals. And he said one of the... Uh, possibilities of art is to actually reintroduce rituals in, into society. Yes, there is uh, there is something behind uh, in my in my practice, which is our rituals. And in the case of traffic jam, uh, there is a big tradition here as well to go to the mountains through the Basque. Like uh, people come together in the mountain to defend our language or something. Rituals, traditions too, like uh, all tradition of coming together. So all that imaginary is, is there in my work. Even if not working directly with rit rituals, there is something there. And I am so interested at w as well in all these traditions and rituals in places. So as you say in Atascoa, I ask to people to come to the mountains to create a traffic jam. And then uh, on a specific day, we gather there, uh, transforming the, um, the landscape uh, and creating a new situation, a new ri ritual. Normally, the traffic jam is something you find in your way to somewhere. Here, it was the other way around. We, we made a way to arrive to the traffic jam. So it's changing the ritual too, and creating this all together in the mountains. And um, as you say, many people came for environmental reasons. Uh, someone came and said and tell us he was coming because uh, he thought this was a very good way of visualizing the massive use of the car and 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 that's why he came but at the same time some other car lovers came and they came because they love their cars and because uh, they are very proud of their cars so um, in a way through these art, uh, uh, artworks, they can, pe they can people together, people with different ideology, that they will not come together in another situation. But through the piece of art, they, they come, and, and in a way, this is what I, I call, they create um, new collectivities. Uh, people from different ideologies that they come together for for transforming a, a normal traffic jam into a party, let's say, in a, a one day in the mountains. But then uh, many things happen uh, under that situation. Thank you. Now, obviously, uh, the, we talked about public art and we talked about your piece, you know, in Bilbao. You've done 
many other public art projects and you call them interventions often. Uh, I uh, remember, for example, the intervention in a public space in Sharjah, where you actually, again, worked with a ritual, the ritual of football, uh, and, and somehow shifted or changed that ritual because uh, uh, it worked with signage, uh, with public space, you know, paint, but also uh, by actually interfering with the goalposts. Can you tell us a little bit about provisions for the future and how you did a public intervention there with a really very public ritual, the ritual of football? Yes, because as you say, this idea of ritual is that I, I, I think it is that I work with already existing situations where I create a small change in them. And as you say, here is football. Football is something and a football field that we all can recognize. Uh, again, it was done specifically for this square in Sarsha. So what I did uh, was to paint a football field in the middle of the square, so that uh, street lamps, but a bench, but everything is interfering with the game, so that it seems yeah. that the game is impossible. But through this impossibility, uh, and from the capacity of people to create public space, what it happened there is that everyone used the public space at the same time, cohabitating it, using it in different ways, so that while children are playing football uh, in the football field, women are chatting in the bench in the middle of the same football field. And some other children are playing cricket in the opposite direction, but in the same space. And bicycles are riding and people is walking, crossing the football field. So for me, it's like 1,000 one thousand ways of using the public space at the same time at the same place. So what it happened there for me was quite something like how we can all live together in the same place in the same in the same time. Now uh, another thing in terms of public art, which I think is important is uh, one of my first studio visits when I was a teenager was with Vito Acconci. It was on my first trip to New York. Um, and I always remember because of Vito has been doing a lot of public art interventions and uh, later in his life went also into architecture uh, and said actually, you know, that changed from the I to the we. He said when he was an artist, he would always say I. And then when he was in the public art sector, you know, he, in the, when he was in architecture, he would sort of more refer to as we. But he said something very important, which always marked me in that very first studio visit I made with him. He said there is no no such thing as, you know, public space, given, you know, public space. But there is this idea of us making things, you know, public. And uh, that is something which, you know, you uh, often do. I mean, you you do it when you work with a museum, you make, you know, you make it public, but also when you work in squares and when you make your interventions. And one piece I've always been fascinated by is the uh, Noche and Bianco piece, you know, where you actually brought 366 chairs in uh, in the urban space and, and, and basically occupied squares, which otherwise were empty. And immediately a completely new different space was kind of created. And it's interesting because I suppose people didn't really realize that it was an artwork until it was removed, you know, when the time, I mean, it's always interesting, you know, uh, when when all of a sudden you add something to the city and then people can enjoy it and it creates something very special for them. And all of a sudden, when you take it away again, people realize, well, this was actually not there, whilst when it's there, it could always have been there. Yes, yes, I completely agree with the idea of publicness uh, you were talking about. And uh, I have always uh, noticed and been quite annoyed on how the design of the public space, how the city is built, is making us acting in a certain way. So we walk in the, ped in the pedestrian way, but in the road we can't be only in the crossing paths. And in the grass, some, in some countries you can lie, in some others you can't. So the design of the public space normally is marking how we move in and relate in the public space. And my idea of the publicness is the opposite. As you say, for me the idea of public space is that 
the way we move and relate in the city is the one yeah. creating city. So uh, I, in that sense, I believe in people's capacity to create public space just by being there, just by, by, by moving and relating in there, you are creating public space. And a very good example of these ideas is the piece you mentioned, uh, 360 chairs. So in that piece, I place in, in two squares in Madrid that they didn't have any previous design marking how to act in there, I place 366 chairs. These chairs can be moved. So if a very, very gr big group of people comes, let's say 20 people comes, they create a big cycle. But maybe uh, when they leave, I arrive and I move one of the chairs and I, and I create another structure of the city, of the yeah. square. So ar around the time, uh, I recorded all the different distributions uh, that people was creating, and this is how the design or the city was created by the movements and relations of people. And, and, and that is something uh, that I think is key, is, is the key for understanding publicness. Now, one of your most ambitious projects, and, uh, you know, I initially in relation to your 24-hour project for the museum in Bilbao, I mentioned Philippe Arenos, uh, you know, homage to René, Dema René Domal, uh, Le Mans Analogue, and you actually uh, literally built a mountain. Not many artists have actually built a mountain. In 2013, you were invited to Lower Austria, uh, a, a place called Grafeneck, uh, and you created this 2,600-meter uh, cube of earth and grass, a mountain from which actually to view uh, the landscape. Can you tell us about, about your mountain and the name of the mountain? Yes. So they invite me to this park that they were about to build a lake. So they, the invitation actually was to do something in the lake shore, maybe somewhere to see it, or that was the starting point for the invitation. But then after my site visit and thinking about this idea of building a lake, taking out some land of, on that park, I came up with this idea of with the land, with the earth, taking out to build the lake, to build a mountain uh, right in the, by, by the lake. So it was, let's say, um, to keep things as they were in a different form. So the, the, the gap the lake was leaving, it became a mountain. This mountain is very small to be a mountain, but very big to be a piece of earth, you know, like, uh, so it's as well a way of watching the landscape th from different uh, point of view, and as well something that happens a lot in my project, and I think is interesting, is the relations in, in between the scales. So a person in this mountain is quite a big person, and the mountain yeah. is very small. But if we see this mountain without the person, uh, it, it can be considered a quite a big mountain too. And of course the mountain leads us also to the hill, and uh, another really well-known piece of yours, a more recent piece, uh, the 25 people on 25 hills, and uh, the 25 people actually on one hill, and that again, you know, connects to this idea how to live together. Can you tell us about the epiphany or the revelation of two these 25 hills which happened in the landscape? Yes, so uh, this project uh, was made in Cappadocia, in Turkey, where there is a very specific uh, geography um, and formation. So there are these uh, soft mountains are called that they are very specific. So uh, uh, I did an action there in which 25 people were uh, placed in each in one mountain. So we see a, a mountain landscape full of, of little hills and on top of each hill we see one person. But then later the same amount of people, the same people rearrange and they place all of them in one hill. 
So for me, it's not only about giving a scale to the landscape through the people, we can see again, understand through the people the landscape, but uh, how we live together, how we, I always imagine with this piece, like imagine 25 people living at the same home or uh, 25 people living each in one home. So how things are different and as well, how we relate in between and with the territory too. It's a very strong relationship between people and the landscape. Now, uh, what, hello, yes, can you hear me? Ah, uh, great, yes. One thing which, uh, of course, is important also when we talk about public art is the idea of, uh, of the unrealized project. As you know, I'm very interested in unrealized projects and there is, um, uh, of course, a whole range of, of unrealized projects. I mean, the other day, I visited the wonderful poet Ethel Nan, the artist and poet, and she told me actually um, when she was young in Lebanon, she really wanted to be an architect. So her, her unrealized project was to be an architect, and she still wants to build her house. It's her, her dream is to build to build her house. So of course, this idea of a dream, I think we all have dreams, but then there are also the unrealized projects which are utopic, which are unbuildable, which we will never build because they are somehow you know non-realizable. Uh, then there are the projects which are partially realizable. Then there are the projects which uh, we have forgotten about. I call them the projet de tiroir, you know, projects we forgot in our lockers and in our files. Uh, then, of course, with public art, there is also the lost competition entries, because I think uh, that's where public art is closest to architecture, because it's actually the only aspect of the art world where there is a competition, you know, uh, usually, and one project gets realized and the others aren't. Uh, a bit like in the architecture field. So obviously a lot of public artworks are lost competition entries. Uh, then there is, of course, also censorship. And uh, uh, Doris Lessing, whom I met when I moved to London in 2006, whenever I saw her and asked her once more this question of her unrealized projects, her unwritten books, she would tell me there is also a category of the projects which we, we haven't dared to do. And that's, she called that category, you know, a form of self-censorship. So there are many different reasons why a project is um, is unrealized. It's not always because the project is too big. Sometimes it's also because the project is too small. So um, uh, anyway, I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit because I'm sure given the way you work uh, with mountains and many other uh, really very, you know, uh, large scale ideas, you must have unrealized projects. I have so many unrealized projects. Uh, I hope not as much as the ones I did, but uh, many, many, many non-realized projects. So uh, for me, it's something very interesting because apart from the frustration of not being able to do it when you think it is like such a good project because you, you announce very well all the reasons why uh, one project can be done. Sometimes it's very good project, but um, I don't know. Sometimes it happens to me that uh, they invite me and they already expect a very specific project, but I work site specific, so I come up with a new project and they might have in mind Atascoa. So I say, but this might be the new Atascoa, the traffic jam. So um, it's very complex, but I have many non-realized projects, but as well, uh, um, I, uh, when you were talking, I remember how, for example, the Fountains project was a non-realized project. And later on, I found out the context where they could work. So sometimes you don't realize a project and it's not the right moment to do it because any reason or because you couldn't do it. But then uh, uh, there are some that they remain interested. Uh, their interest can keep. And then, I, of course, I have some other projects that I didn't do, but then it's true that even I never did it, them, that idea behind of that project has echoes in other projects in the future, let's say. So yeah. I try not to be frustrated with not, not unrealized projects because I think they contribute to 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 the future thinking and yeah. yeah and can you give us maybe one example of a project which you know 
a lost competition entry, a regret? You know, do you have a regret? Uh, a regret f that one I did or the one I didn't do? The, a regret of a project you wanted to do and you couldn't do. Yes. So uh, I, the first one it came to me, it's a project I did from, well, I, I thought for Belgium, for a, in a specific um, context. And um, I don't know, it was, there were a lot of uh, tourism, tourists in a very agri agricultural um, land, let's say. So I, I, I came up with this uh, project in which people was camouflaged in the, in the landscape, and then when tourists come, they move. And then it really wasn't understood, this project. They thought it was kind of a joke or something, and then it wasn't never realized. But I thought I found, I found the, the right point of that area, this tourism. Yeah. And because they weren't pointing me the tourism as a, as yeah. a point of intervening. So I, very often they invite me to something and I come up with another thing. So this is not always easy to understand. In this project, it didn't go on. And in Polder Cup, for example, in the Netherlands, they invite me for a, to a facade project. And from that invitation, I propose this one day football championship in the polder. So I changed completely the invitation and there it devel develop. But in this other project of the natural and camouflage with the land, it didn't yeah. work. And uh, did you ever encounter censorship that an institution or a city or a client was not, you know, thought the project was too risky or have you ever encountered censorship? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I, I, I don't call it censorship, but as you see, as you say, uh, things, let's say things that they didn't expect, they will come, so it is not developed. And it's very often happened this. But we are almost finished. You, you have given me great answers. This was a really great interview. <laughs> Um, I uh, wanted to ask you, uh, have you ever thought of, uh, of going into urbanism or architecture? So, um, as you say, in, in, my, in my work is so related to architecture, to urbanism. Yeah. Um, and I think I, I, I could offer a lot, but as well, I think through my projects, all these suggestions are are coming there, and many of my projects are temporary, uh, that they come up in a certain moment and then they already remain in people's memory and through the piece of art coming out from it. So, of course, I think in, 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 in urbanism, and I think I could do something there, but as well, I think the way I propose things, they might have an effect. Great. But thank you so, so much. This was really a fantastic interview. Eh, Maider, por volver un momento hacia atrás, hacia, hacia Arnasa, a mí yo creo que es bueno que precisemos, por ejemplo, que Arnasa se presentó al público el pasado 4 de junio, que es una instalación de, de luz, una pieza efímera, y que va a poder verse eh, durante todo el verano eh, entre el anochecer y la una de madrugada en, en el museo. Eh, yo creo que también que una de sus peculiaridades que es una pieza concebida por ti para ser contemplada de exterior, desde el exterior del museo y no desde el interior, que sería quizás lo, lo habitual. Eso es. Eh, como ya he contado antes, pero me apetece ya en mi idioma y con la tranquilidad de, de estar hablando castellano, explicarte un poco también mejor la obra. Eh, la pieza parte de elementos existentes, como es la luz en el museo, y lo que hace es una graduación de luz muy, muy sutil, muy lenta, eh, que va encendiendo las luces del museo y apagándolos al ritmo de la respiración. Así pues, eh, el museo se expande, sale de sus propios límites, digamos, y, y conecta eh, con la calle. Como tú dices, es una pieza eh, hecha para ser vista desde la calle, para entender el museo desde fuera, para mirarlo desde fuera, para como aproximarnos a él desde fuera, porque normalmente es a través de la visita de las salas, de mirar el cuadro de cerca, a través de esa 
de ese límite que se puede, eh, suele poner para no acercarse más, aquí es lo contrario, es como desde la calle mirar al interior del museo y cómo el museo emana esta luz eh, en constante movimiento al ritmo lento y calmado de la respiración que hace que desde la calle nos mm, veamos el museo y conectemos con él. Sí, yo también por volver atrás, aunque hemos hablado con, con Hans de la situación en la que se produce el, el encargo del, del museo, yo sí creo que es bueno que precisemos que el, um, tiene lugar no solo durante el confinamiento, sino en unos momentos en, en los que los museos o este museo piensa que vamos a seguir confinados durante mucho tiempo. Um, eh, yo creo que finalmente pudimos, el museo pudo abrir sus puertas el, el 1 de junio, hace ahora dos meses, pero es cierto que esa situación especial y ese, digamos, eh, futuro todavía dudoso influyó mucho en la génesis y en la formalización de la pieza, creo. Eso es, recibí vuestra llamada y, y nos reunimos telemáticamente eh, en el confinamiento más duro, digamos, mm. cuando no podíamos salir de casa, pero sobre todo eh, nos planteábamos esa situación en la que en algún momento ya se hablaba de que la gente iba a poder salir a pasear eh, y sin embargo los museos iban a estar cerrados. Entonces, ¿de qué manera, cómo...? Eh, intervenir en el museo eh, no pudiendo entrar a él, ¿no? Y eso marcó como un marco conceptual a partir del cual pensar el museo. Cómo mirarlo desde fuera, cómo pensarlo desde el exterior, cómo conectarlo a la ciudad. Y, y a partir también de esos pensamientos es que... Es que, es que surge el proyecto también, uh -huh. aunque luego sí que los museos se abrieron antes de lo que se tenía previsto, sí. no, no cambió en nada, digamos, el, el planteamiento. No, es curioso además que yo creo que la, la propia obra ha ido evolucionando desde su presentación en junio, en unos momentos en los que de hecho eh, podíamos salir a, a pasear todavía, de hecho con cierta libertad, sin mascarilla, por ejemplo, y la situación actual en la cual, digamos, el museo, el interior se ha normalizado, pero da la sensación de que el exterior eh, se ha complicado, sí. por ejemplo. A mí me parece una paradoja curiosa poder ver, volver a ver la pieza ahora, después de, del gran desconfinamiento eh, producido a comienzos de, de junio. Eh, me gustaría también hablar un poco de tu práctica artística, aunque también lo has, lo has hecho con, con Hans. Eh, ¿Trabajas así habitualmente? Quiero decir, eh, ¿trabajas siempre a partir de una invitación específica de un comisario, de una institución, de un evento, para eh, comenzar a trabajar en un proyecto, para dar origen a, a una pieza? Muchas veces trabajo a partir de la invitación a trabajar en un contexto determinado, pero no siempre. Eh, en otras ocasiones, como por ejemplo Atasco A, no viene a partir de una invitación, sino que fue que, que yo quería hacer Atasco A y vi cómo hacerlo, digamos. Entonces eh, fue a la inversa, digamos, pero en general, o muchas, bueno, casi siempre trabajo para, en contextos determinados, uh -huh. eso seguro. Y muchas veces eh, con la invitación de un museo o, o comisario o bienal a trabajar en un determinado contexto. Es así que el trabajo en común con, con el comisario, la visita al lugar, sí. siempre, acuérdate también cuando, cuando me llamasteis para este proyecto que estábamos confinados, yo dije, yo vivo en San Sebastián y dije, pero si necesito hacer el, el sí. site visit, la visita, eh, aunque conozca el museo, conozco sí. el museo, conozco el contexto, pero tengo como que, para mí es muy importante ese reconocer el lugar desde el proyecto, porque a partir de detalles muy específicos suele surgir eh, el proyecto, que es y responde a un contexto muy determinado, uh -huh. pero que me interesa es que funcione más allá de él. Como Arnasa, que es un proyecto realizado eh, para el Museo de Bellas Artes de Bilbao, en un momento en el que todos los museos, o casi todos los museos del mundo, estaban cerrados, uh -huh. y trabajando con la especificidad de este museo surge un proyecto en el que el Museo de Bellas Artes de Bilbao podría ser cualquier museo sí. del mundo, digamos, cualquier museo que en, en, 
en la graduación de la luz eh, pareciera que está respirando, no solo el edificio emanando esa como luz interior, sino que también eh, las obras de arte que, que, que en él hay, las escaleras, el, eh, las paredes, todos los detalles arquitectónicos aparecen y desaparecen en, al ritmo de las luz. Sí, es cierto. ¿Por qué te interesó? Eh, trabajar con la respiración, porque es cierto que tu, eh, tu propuesta de que la, la, la pieza fuera en ese sentido fue prácticamente inmediata. Bueno, eh, quizá desde fuera pareció inmediata, Ahora, para mí eh, fue lar no larguísima, porque sé que en el tiempo no fue tan larga, pero muy intensa. Desde que recibí vuestra llamada hasta que os hice la propuesta, eh, como únicamente trabajé en esto, eh, en una situación eso, eh, de confinamiento, pero toda la energía eh, centrada en ella. Entonces, algo muy específico del museo, para mí, es esa conexión dentro-fuera a través de las cristaleras y las ventanas. Entonces, eh, desde la idea de cómo intervenir el museo eh, desde fuera o para ser visto desde fuera, más ese interés que me surgió eh, la conexión dentro-fuera, aunque muchas veces hay unas cortinas que no permite ver el interior, sí que hay esa conexión a través de las ventanas del dentro-fuera y el elemento de la luz. Y entonces, en ese momento en el que el COVID era básicamente una, una, un, un tema respiratorio, mm. Planteé esa posibilidad de que a través de la luz y de la graduación de la luz eh, el edificio fuera como, como con el ritmo de la luz refiriéndose a esa respiración y también como eh, llevando la mirada del, del paseante uh -huh. eh, al museo. Es cierto que cuando pasea, eh, paseas de noche por el parque eh, la mirada... Del, del paseante eh, la llevas, la conduces hacia elementos o hacia eh, espacios del museo que habitualmente pasan desapercibidos. A mí, por ejemplo, me sorprendió mucho la importancia que cobra en tu instalación eh, la fachada, una de las fachadas laterales, la que da el parque, sí. la zona de la cafetería, sí. el gran eh, foso de la biblioteca, por ejemplo, la, la, la zona del nexo de unión de comunicación entre los dos edificios históricos del... ¿Cómo cada cuánto, cómo, cómo se produce, cómo cada cuánto respira uh -huh. el, el edificio? ¿Cuál es la transición uh -huh. que le has planteado de, uh -huh. de la luz? Sí, sí eh, que no se me olvide contestarte a, como al cada cuánto, al tiempo, pero eh, como has dicho, eh, en, en muchas ocasiones a través de, mi, de, de la pieza, de, la pieza uh -huh. de arte, eh, en muchas ocasiones mi trabajo sirve para ver el lugar para ver lo que ya estaba ahí. Entonces, a través de la transformación en la luz y de esta graduación de luz, como tú has dicho, miramos el museo y vemos eh, cosas que antes no habíamos visto. Y alguien que trabaja en el museo eh, me dijo que, que en la fachada que tú dices que da el parque uh -huh. veía la rampa, que normalmente sí. hubiera parecido que era recto. Entonces, eh, en muchas ocasiones mi pieza es el punto de partida para descubrir el lugar. Eh, empiezas mirando eh, la instalación, uh -huh. pero acabas descubriendo el lugar sí. o algo así. Y luego, con respecto a, al ciclo de luz, eh, de hecho, la sensación de que el museo respira viene dada por la vinculación del ritmo de luz a, a los tiempos y frecuencia de la respiración humana. Entonces, eh, la transición de oscuridad a luz, que podría ser cuando cogemos aire, sí. es, dura 8 segundos. Luego hay un tiempo de apnea o retención de aire, que, que aquí es un momento de, en el que se fija la luz, tanto en oscuridad o en luz, que dura aproximadamente 4 segundos. Otra vez la transición a oscuridad y luego un momento de quietud en oscuridad. Este ciclo que equivale a a coger aire, retener, expulsar, uh -huh, sí. retener, es lo que da, y sobre todo la continuidad de este ciclo, es lo que da la sensación de que el edificio respira. Uh -huh. eh, no es esta, de todas formas, tu primera instalación de luz, ¿verdad? Yo creo que, eh, creo que todavía está en, 
eh, activada, pero pocos meses antes había realizado una pieza eh, también muy, eh, muy singular para el C3A de, de Córdoba, una pieza que también juega con la luz, pero yo creo que curiosamente eh, produce el efecto contrario al que, al que tiene lugar en Garnasa. Quiero decir que en la pieza de Córdoba como que el edificio eh, y la instalación se mimetiza. Aquí yo creo que haces un poco lo contrario, des integras el, el edificio eh, con otro ritmo en el, en el día a día de la ciudad, que ha comenzado siendo muy eh, lento, que ha costado, digamos, recobrar uh -huh. el ritmo de la ciudad, pero que de junio ahora ha vuelto a ser muy intenso, muy, muy, muy de latir, uh -huh. eh, eh, mucho más intensamente. Eh... Sí, efectivamente... Es como algo que sucede muchas veces en, en mi trabajo, como hacer desaparecer mm. o hacer aparecer algo, visibilizar y ocultar. Eh, eh, como, como en Shanghái que hice desaparecer la publicidad que se veía desde un determinado punto de vista o, o incluso en Nueva Zelanda que también hice desaparecer la publicidad mientras otras veces evidencio la presencia, visibilizo algo y en este caso como planteas en Arnasa eh, visibilizo eh, el propio edificio del museo, el propio museo, a través de, de esta luz que va transformándose. Sin embargo, en Córdoba, eh, en la fachada mediática del C3A, eh, lo que hago es hacer desaparecer el edificio de una manera simbólica, porque uh -huh. lo que proyecta la fachada es las luces de la ciudad que hay detrás del edificio. Entonces, a lo largo de una noche grabé todos los cambios de luz que sucedían y la fachada lo proyecta, de manera que lo que vemos es lo que hay detrás del propio edificio. Es decir, como si el edificio no estuviera, lo hacemos desaparecer. Pues Maider, muchas gracias por haber estado aquí con nosotros. Ha sido fascinante poder compartir contigo reflexiones sobre Arnasa y sobre otras piezas tuyas. Eh, muchísimas gracias y hasta pronto. Millasker, placerra.